Welcome back guys. Now in this video let's discuss about a condition called as disseminated intravascular coagulation. Okay, so disseminated intravascular coagulation which is simply called as DIC. Now properly look at the name. The name itself it's very clear there is a dissemination means throughout the body multiple places okay not just localized to one place disseminated intravascular within the blood vessels there is unnecessary coagulation which is pathological so unnecessarily there is intravascular clots that are forming okay so this disseminated intravascular coagulation is a consumptive okay, it's a consumptive coagulopathy So this is the heart, okay, the entire, for the entire discussion, this word is the heart, sir, it's like a heart. So consumptive coagulopathy, unnecessarily, there is a consumption of the platelets, consumption of the clotting factors. The clotting factors are unnecessarily getting consumed, okay, without any purpose, unnecessarily the clotting factors are being used up. Okay, why they are being used up, I will discuss. So there is consumptive coagulopathy. So why? Because of unnecessary usage of, of the clotting factors the clotting factors levels goes down as the clotting factors are getting decreased because they are continuously being consumed so what happened to the patient the patient is going to have bleeding now he will die with bleeding okay he will die with bleeding so disseminated intravascular coagulation because of the unnecessary formation of the clots in the body there is no clot formation in the place where it is required so the patient is going to bleed to death okay so what else i want you to know is sir in this patient there is unnecessary formation of platelet microthrombi okay so there is unnecessary formation of the platelet microthrombi so this platelet microthrombi are going to cause the blockage of the blood vessel leading to thrombosis okay this thrombosis is going to lead to ischemia and that ischemia can ultimately lead to infarction okay infarction within the tissues so the problem with the disseminated intravascular coagulation is the infarction of the tissue the tissue death is going to occur now my question is why DIC what's the problem with the DIC see DIC is a complication there is actually a primary problem there is some primary problem okay they, you need to address this primary problem primary problem okay there is some primary problem and that's what leading to the disseminated intravascular coagulation so which problem sir in which conditions you can have this disseminated intravascular coagulation so problem number one there are obstetric complications okay obstetric related issues okay let me write here number one is obstetric complications okay obstetric complications sir which obstetric complications the number one complication which i want you to know is amniotic fluid embolism so what happens is the amniotic fluid in which the baby is happily swimming the amniotic fluid during the time of delivery maybe during the time of delivery uh, this amniotic fluid it's entering into the mother's maternal circulation okay it's entering into the maternal circulation now this amniotic fluid it is having a lot of tissue factor sir it's having a lot of tissue factor amniotic fluid contains a lot of tissue factor you know a tissue factor the clotting factor number three activates seven seven activates ten ten to five five to two two to one you know it the automatically clotting will happen so whenever there is this amniotic fluid embolism that can lead to DIC it can trigger the DIC because amniotic fluid contains tissue factor okay amniotic fluid it contains tissue factor the second condition is abruptio placenta abruptio placenta so in the name itself it says the placenta is getting abruptly separated there is a tissue damage sir so imagine this is the uterus okay uterus the placenta is attached to the uterine wall 
because of a fall because of some trauma or because of uh, like you know preeclampsia or uh, like you know eclampsia in hypotensive conditions there there is a chance that the patient can have abrupt placenta premature separation of the placenta is nothing you can consider it as a trauma you can consider it as a tissue like you know damage so whenever the tissues are getting damaged you know it tissue factor is going to be released now from this abrupt placenta from here the tissue factor whatever is getting released now it's going to enter into the maternal circulation the tissue factor from the placenta is going to enter into the maternal circulation this tissue factor is going to cause widespread intravascular coagulation within the mother so again consumptive coagulopathy that there is consumption of the platelets there is consumption of the clotting factors so the mother can die with bleeding okay unnecessary clots are forming so the place where she was supposed to have the clot formation there the clot formation is not going to occur she is going to die with bleeding so abrupt placenta can cause um, uh, uh, the disseminated intravascular coagulation what else can cause is third one is postpartum hemorrhage okay post partum hemorrhage see postpartum hemorrhage there is a pph you know it so pph can also like pph is also you, you can consider it as a damage tissue damage that can also trigger the disseminated intravascular coagulation so obstetric complications these obstetric complication can lead to dic apart from this sir what else if the person is having adenocarcinoma okay for example gastric adenocarcinoma esophageal adenocarcinoma you know in the name itself it is there adenocarcinoma adeno means glands so this adenocarcinoma so what they will produce they will produce mucin so what this mucin will do or mucus mucin is going to stimulate the clotting unnecessarily see there is no damage to the blood vessel but unnecessary clots are getting formed okay clotting factors are activated the clotting factors are getting used up consumed okay so adenocarcinomas third condition is um, certain types of cancers like acute promyelocytic leukemia acute pro myelocytic leukemia okay sir in acute pro myelocytic leukemia in these cancers this is actually a cancer wbc right now here in this cancer cells there are primary granules primary granules see these primary granules contain substances when they leak they can actually trigger the clotting cascade they will activate the clotting unnecessarily okay so in the promyelocytic leukemia these cancer cells you know how the cancer cells are they are very much prone to damage they will easily undergo rupture they will release this primary granule contents those contents will actually trigger the clot formation and conditions like sepsis Sepsis means what? Infection within the blood, especially infections with E. coli or Neisseria meningitis. See so these organisms. What they will do is, so these organisms, they are going to produce bacterial endotoxins. Okay, they are going to produce. endotoxins so these endotoxins they will act on the endothelial cells they will stimulate the endothelial cells to release the tissue factor and that tissue factor you know it it will start the clotting cascade so in a simple way these endotoxins are the ones which favor the clotting okay these endotoxins stimulate the clotting factors so again clotting will occur this is one of the cause adenocarcinoma completed acute promyelocytic leukemia and the last thing which i want you to know is rattle snake bite rattle snake bite so this rattle snake bite the venom whatever is coming it is going to stimulate the clotting okay it is going to stimulate the clot formation done so these are all the primary causes at the end of the day the point which i want to highlight here is so there is some primary problem what are the primary problems like obstetric complications endocarcinoma acute promyelocytic leukemia rattle snake um, poisoning or uh, uh, this uh, sepsis these are the primary problems they will lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation they will lead to the clot formations okay now in these conditions what kind of lab changes you will appreciate labs so in the labs the platelet count look at the platelet count platelet count is going to go down 
there is a decrease in the platelet count. Why consumptive coagulopathy? The platelets are being up unnecessarily used up. As the platelet count is going down, what about the bleeding time? Bleeding time increases. What about the PT and PTT? PT and PTT are going to be elevated. Okay. Now, say unnecessarily within the uh, within the blood vessels, the clots are forming, right? Unnecessarily, the clots are being formed. Okay, platelet microthrombic clot, uh, clots are being formed. Now, because of these clots, okay, you already know it. Now, you should tell me what is happening. So, within the blood vessels, unnecessarily, these clots are forming. So, now this platelet microthrombi, what they will do? They will shear the RBCs. They will cause damage to the RBCs, leading to uh, uh, leading to microangiopathic. The patients are going to have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which will show you cystocytes. Cystocytes are helmet cells. Okay, cystocytes are helmet cells, which are nothing but the broken RBCs, damaged RBCs, which are looking like a helmets. So this one, sir. What else you can see is. See, unnecessarily within the body, there are clot formations. Okay, the clots are forming unnecessarily. But what your body tries to do, the body tries to remove these clots. Are unnecessary, there is so many, so many clots are forming, which is not good because that can lead to ischemia and infarction. So what my body will try to do is to remove those clots. So my body is doing fibrinolysis breakdown. Okay, fibrinolysis. So the fibrin degradation products. Okay, the fibrin degradation products which are called as a D dimers are elevated. So what are D dimers? The D dimers are nothing but the fibrin degradation product due to the process of the natural hemo, uh, like fibrinolysis whatever is happening in the body. So the fibrin degraded products which are called as a D dimers they are elevated. This is the best screening test that checking the D dimer levels is the best screening test for disseminated intravascular coagulation okay disseminated intravascular coagulation it's a checking the d-dimer levels so what is the treatment done for these patients see i have said you it's a consumptive coagulopathy unnecessarily the clotting factors are getting consumed so clotting factor levels are going down so pt ptt is elevated what you have to do is replace the clotting factors that is give them cryo precipitate so it's a cryo precipitate so what is cryo precipitate it contains Clotting factors. Okay, it contains the clotting factors. Give them the cryoprecipitate, and also you can give the transfusions for the platelets. Okay. So cryoprecipitate and transfusions can be given. So with this, the disseminated intravascular coagulation important points which I want you to know are completed. Now let's discuss about the fibrinolysis. Normal fibrinolysis, sir. Okay, so in the name itself, it's a fibrin lysis. Okay, fibrin lysis. So why fibrinolysis? My question to you is: See, now within a blood vessel, say there is a damage to a blood vessel. If there is a damage to a blood vessel, clot is going to form in that area. Okay, platelet microthrombi is going to form in that area. So to seal the blood vessel, once the blood vessel is totally healed, okay, when the blood vessel is completely healed, do you still require the platelet microthrombi in that area? No, we need to break down. We need to break down that platelet microthrombi. You need to. Like you know, clear that clot. Okay, so the fibrin whatever is there, or with the fibrinogen whatever is coming into that area. So you need to break down. Okay, the clot. This is called as a fibrinolysis, and that is something absolutely physiological. You have to do it. Okay. So how normal fibrinolysis is happening? Let me tell you. Let me put it this way, sir. Endothelial cells are there, right? Endothelial cells. Now, this endothelial cells, healthy endothelial cells, after the repair is completed, they are producing a substance called as tissue plasminogen activator. Okay, tissue plasminogen activator. Now, what this tissue plasminogen activator is going to do? It will convert okay, a substance called as plasminogen. The plasminogen. See in the name itself, it's a plasmin ogen. Ogen means inactive substance. The plasmin ogen is now going to be converted into plasmin. 
here plasmin is the hero now what this plasmin will do so plasmin is going to break fibrin okay it's going to break the fibrin it also breaks the fibrinogen it will also break the other clotting factors okay and plasmin is also going to inhibit it, it inhibits platelet aggregation okay it inhibits the platelet aggregation sir so this is anti thrombosis means anti clotting once the clot is formed you need to remove the clot okay you need to remove the clot so what exactly is happening is so plasminogen is converted into plasmin so plasmin is the one which converts uh, sorry pl plasmin is the one which breaks the clot which breaks the clot sir anti clotting okay now what i want you to know is in our body for everything there is a proper regulation okay so the plasmin it looks like it looks like a king but even the king is under the control he cannot do anything whatever he wants no in our body it's not like that outside the body he can do anything maybe but in the body the no one is like a king it looks like a king but it's not even its activity is regulated okay so this plasmin activity is inhibited by okay plasmin activity is inhibited by alpha 2 anti plasmin this molecule called as alpha 2 anti plasmin what it is doing it is controlling the activity of plasmin otherwise plasmin will continuously continuously destroys the clotting factor so that all the clotting factors are totally gone so that again the patient can go into the bleeding okay so alpha 2 anti plasmin is inhibiting the plasmin from where this alpha 2 anti plasmin is coming this alpha 2 anti plasmin is coming from the liver okay liver is producing this alpha 2 anti plasmin okay next who is promoting the activity of plasmin there is something called as urokinase urokinase activates the plasmin activity okay so urokinase from where this urokinase is coming i will explain you later okay so even the plasmin activity is regulated by alpha 2 anti plasmin as well as urokinase urokinase stimulates alpha 2 anti plasmin inhibits now after discussing this the normal fibrinolysis now let's discuss uh, the disorders of fibrinolysis disorders okay disorders of fibrinolysis now what's the problem in this disorders a simple only one problem is plasmin overactivity plasmin overaction okay plasmin overactivity So why this plasmin is doing overaction? You just think logically, sir. Who can activate the plasmin? Urokinase. If there is excessive amount of urokinase, so more plasmin activity. More plasmin means more anti-clotting. It destroys all the clotting factors. If the clotting factors are not there, means more bleeding can occur. So it's a disorder. Okay. Or if there is a deficiency of alpha to anti-plasmin, if this is not there, now the plasmin activity is not regulated properly. No alpha to anti-plasmin. The plasmin is not getting inhibited. The plasmin is not inhibited means. more activation more uh, like more destruction of the uh, clotting factors so let's write one by one sir when you are doing okay there is a surgery called as a radical prostatectomy radical prostatectomy so during radical prostatectomy who is going to be released there is release of urokinase now you know it urokinase activates the plasmin so what plasmin will do you know it plasmin is going to destroy clotting factors so what happens bleeding okay the patient is going to have the bleeding next sir if there is liver cirrhosis okay there is liver cirrhosis the patient is having liver cirrhosis now in liver cirrhosis i have said you it's a liver which produces the alpha 2 anti plasmin in liver cirrhosis the entire liver is gone so alpha 2 anti plasmin levels decreases when alpha 2 anti plasmin is not there plasmin is overactivated 
overaction of plasmin. What plasmin will do? Now this overactivated plasmin, what it will do? It will destroy the clotting factors that can lead to the bleeding again. Okay. So for example, if you check the labs, what you will see in the labs? Sir? See, in the labs, because of this pl uh, plasmin overaction, more and more clotting factors are getting destroyed. So what about the PT and PTT levels? PT and PTT, both are going to be elevated because the clotting factors are getting destroyed. Okay, both PT and PTT. And what about the bleeding time? So bleeding time. Even the bleeding time is going to increase. Why? There is no problem with the platelets. Platelets are normal. See, platelet count. Platelet count is normal. Despite of normal platelet count, why the bleeding time is getting increased? Because plasmin inhibits the platelet aggregation. Okay, plasmin, what it is doing? It is inhibiting the platelet aggregation. Look here, platelet aggregation. So without platelet aggregation, it cannot stop the bleeding. So bleeding time increases. Okay, now what is the treatment for this um, fibrolytic disorders? Okay, what is the treatment? What you have to do? The treatment is amino caproic acid. So giving amino caproic acid. So why amino caproic acid? Because amino caproic acid, look here. What amino caproic acid is going to do is amino caproic acid is going to inhibit this process. It's a conversion of plasminogen into plasmin. So amino caproic acid is going to inhibit the production of plasmin. Without plasmin, clotting factors are not destroyed. So liver is going to produce the clotting factors. Things done. Okay, so you have to decrease the amount of plasmin activity that can be done with a drug called as amino caproic acid. So with this, we have completed the disseminated intravascular coagulation. We have seen the fibrinolysis, normal fibrinolysis and disorders of the fibrinolysis. Two disorders we have seen that is a radical prostatectomy during radical prostatectomy and during liver cirrhosis, the plasmin overactivity will occur which will inhibit the platelet aggregation and the plasmin is also going to inhibit all the clotting factors. So, with this, the topic is completed. See you in the next video with the other topic. Thank you.